Hello everyone, today we're here with Nisha Moodley. Nisha is a women's leadership coach and the creator of Fierce Fabulous Free, The Freedom Mastermind, and The Virtual Sisterhood. Inspired by the belief that the world will be set free by women who are free and sisterhood is key to a woman's freedom, Nisha creates communities of ambitious women, women to support them in redesigning their lives and businesses. I invited Nisha here because she's one of the most amazing women that I know. In fact, I respect her so much that I hired her to be my personal mentor for her Freedom Mastermind. I just love the way she blends her head and her heart, her intuition and her practicality, and how she's been able to create such an incredible life for herself. So thank you so much for being here, Nisha. Oh, Rachel, thank you. That was such a beautiful introduction. I'm so <laughs> happy to be friends with you, and thank you so much for inviting me here today. Oh, totally. I'm super, super excited about it. So the intention behind A Better Life, as you know, since you helped create it, is to show people that if they have a choice, they can choose a better life. So with that spirit, can you take a minute to share some of the things that you're most proud of in this moment? Just kind of take a minute to brag? Mm, yeah, sure. Gosh, like a really vulnerable one, but it's just the first one that came to mind is that, you know, I've been in a lot of inquiry around relationship partnership lately, and it's actually been pretty, pretty like difficult. I would say the heaviest thing on my heart and mind in the last year has been the kind of, are we in, are we out conversation and partnership. And, you know, even though there's still some inquiry around that, in this moment, I feel really proud to be in a space where I feel pretty light around it, pretty ease-filled. Like my eyes are open to the experience, but my heart is also open and I feel really trusting. And that feels like a huge leap from where I might have been a couple of years ago where, I mean, I was just so desperate to get married again and have a baby and do that whole thing that I really overlooked a lot of difficult things in our relationship. And so it just feels good to have a really open heart and, and feel present and not to say that it never feels challenging, but to be open hearted around all of it and feeling more compassionate and attendant to my desires as well, because I tended in the past to put them on the back burner. So I'm proud of that. And let's just see anything else. Oh, I'm feeling so proud about my new website that is just coming together so beautifully. And yeah, just really excited about that and proud of how it's come together visually and the level of like heart and soul that has been put into it by everybody involved. So that's really exciting too. I can't wait to see it. You showed a little preview on Facebook. It looks gorgeous. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited. It feels very me, which is, I guess, how a good website should feel. <laughs> <laughs> When's it going to come out? It'll be out in the next two weeks. So probably by the time this podcast airs, it'll already be out into the world. Yay. Yeah. Awesome. So... I know that right now you're in a place that's amazing, Brax, by the way. It's really amazing to like to feel ease around. I mean, relationship is such a huge thing, especially like say women as relationships and men is obviously it's important for relationships for men too, but also just they're usually big on like more powery kind of things, like, you know, making their achievement kind of stuff. And so to have that as your main, something that's so important and to feel ease around it, even when it's in an uncertain place is a big deal. Yeah, I mean, trust is like, whew, such a relief to feel trust. And not like trust that I'm going to have it exactly how I want it, but trust that no matter what happens, you know, for, the, for life. Again, I don't feel this 100% of the time, but a lot more um, than I ever did. Just this trust that everything is and will be great. I know this is going to be a big question, so maybe you can't answer it right off the top of your head. But how did you like come to that place where you've decided to have that as a belief? Well, I think that it's a few things. I think part of it is just looking back on all the quote unquote bad things that have ever happened to me. And, you know, I can look at those things and say that, yeah, no one, you know, no one would ever deserve to go through that. Or of course that would be painful for anyone. And like, it's so okay that those things were painful and difficult for me as maybe they should be, you know, they were painful, difficult things. But to also be able to look at them and say that nothing in a way was out of place, like 
all of the things that I've been through in my life, and this might sound cliche because it's a saying that we say, right? Like it made me who I am, but it's <laughs> true. Like all of the things that have happened in my life have given me the life that I have now. They've made me into who I am. If I can look back and see that, I can imagine that going forward, that anything that happens, even if it's painful and difficult in the moment, ultimately will be leading me to something really great in my life. And so just that level of, you know, life isn't supposed to be painless, but I can also feel trust even in the discomfort. So I think that's one thing is just kind of having that more empowering perspective on things that have happened in the past, that there is a purpose for all of it. And I think the other thing is just, I've had experiences in my life of letting go and trusting and just ending up having like really amazing, powerful, beautiful experiences that if I hadn't had trusted, I would have never had that beautiful experience. It's like, you know, I went through a divorce and if I had decided, well, I'm never going to trust anyone again, I'm never going to let anybody into my heart, I would have never had, you know, the relationship that I had after my marriage. And, you know, that relationship, just like any other relationship, wasn't without its challenges, but it was like so rich and beautiful and like has brought my life so many gifts and so just knowing like if as humans we lean towards pleasure and away from pain instinctively to also get that like yes trusting isn't going to necessarily mean that there will be no pain but it'll lead me to open doors for unimaginable pleasure pleasure that I couldn't create if I were just in a state of fear all the time I love that and one of the things that I think you're so good at is just when even if you are in a painful place, you're able to to feel that trust, but then also feel the pain, um, which is really hard to do, to really just be open. Can you actually talk for a minute just on how you're able to do that, how you're able to feel and not, I think it's easier said than done to feel whatever you're feeling. Yeah. I think sometimes it's switching back and forth, you know, like really just feeling the pain. Part of it is there's pain and then there's suffering. And I think this is a really helpful distinction right? Pain is when we're like, oh my gosh, that, ouch, this hurts, you know, and suffering is, ouch, ouch, this hurts. And that means that you're an asshole and I'm this, and this is what it means about the world. Like suffering is when we go into the story and we create a lot of resistance and like, we're human. So we're all going to do that. Sometimes we're all going to like lose it and get pissed, you know, (laughs) or be really mired in our sadness. But it's about kind of like being able to see What parts of it are just like a story that we're creating that's actually causing us more suffering or a resistance to just feeling the pain or just feeling sad? You know, sometimes when I hear people going like really going on and on and about something that's really upsetting them, I can feel like there's something there. They're upset. They're angry. They're hurt. they're, They're feeling something, but they're not actually feeling it. They're talking about it, but they're not actually feeling it. And so I think it's allowing ourselves to bravely feel what it is that we're really feeling and strip away the stories for a moment and just allow it to be like, ow, this is painful. I'm upset or I'm sad or I'm angry or whatever, just feeling the feeling. And for me, it's often just a going back and forth. I'm feeling the feeling and then I'm going, okay, and I know it's not going to feel this way forever. And I know I'm going to have an amazing moment in my life where I know that this is leading to my growth or I know that things will get better. And just kind of allowing myself to go back and forth to really allow myself to feel it and then to really remind myself that it's okay to trust that things will change, that things will improve. And also trusting myself. I think it's not just trusting like God or some sort of divine force or just you know, hoping or something. It's also, I think, trusting ourselves. Like, do I trust myself to, you know, let's say somebody was in like financial difficulty and they were in just feeling a lot of upset or pain over their financial difficulty. And they might say to themselves like, oh, they're feeling the pain. And they might say, I I trust myself to actually pull pull myself through this, to actually do what it takes to move out of this time. I, I trust myself. And that is in my experience, I I don't know that I fully trust myself, but I've certainly been cultivating it over years. And I think it's really a journey, this journey of self-trust. But yeah, 
that's that's kind of it. I think it's for me often just the going back and forth between fully feeling the feeling and then also leaning into the trust. That's such a great outlook and it kind of speaks to just who you are, which is you seem to do everything kind of gently with yourself. <laughs> or at least you have really good exercises like that you try to I mean I'm sure that nobody's perfect but I just love how you're able to do the gentle with yourself and and that made me think when you were talking I read in some books that they say that if you feel a feeling and you truly feel it that I'll go in and out of your system in I think seven minutes or something have you read that and do you find it to be true yeah, I've heard stuff like that before. I actually have a close friend, and she's a former client, actually, and she told me this story about how she had been terrified of flying. When we started working together, she hadn't stepped on a plane in some amount of time, and when she had stepped on a plane, she had to take like some prescription drug or something to kind of knock her out or deal with her anxiety or something. She was just so terrified of flying. And we started working together. She's like, but I want to have this lifestyle where I see the world and I can't take boats and cars all over the world all the time. So I'm going to need to figure this thing out. So she actually decided to go to this school or this program for people who had a fear of flying. And that was one of the things that they taught them. They said, if you just allow the feeling to be there without making a story, just noticing the sensations in your body you know, without spiraling into, oh my gosh, we're going to die. And then, you know, visualizing the face mask falling and drowning and the whole thing, right? That people could do if they were in a plane terrified of flying, just to feel the sensations in their body that it would pass. And so she said on graduation day from this program, all these people who had kind of gone through this whole course got on a plane. And I think that what it was doing, it was like kind of smallish plane and the plane was going to take off and then land again. And that was it. And that was graduation. And they got on the plane and this one person just lost it. They went in into a total panic attack and they were freaking out, like, get me off the plane, open the doors, I can't even sit here. And they just got really upset. And the instructor said, just, hey, just, just feel the sensations, just feel them. You know, forget about the story, just feel the sensation. We, we won't go anywhere, but just feel the sensation. I think it was a guy, he just breathed and breathed and felt the sensations, like actually just felt the tingling, the this, the that, the nervousness in the belly, just felt all the sensations. And something like three minutes later, he was fine. And they took off and they landed and everything was fine. Like from literal panic attack, like maybe on the edge of a panic attack to totally calm and able to face his fear. Wow. Yeah. And I just thought it was so beautifully illustrative of how like it was really just a few minutes if he had really gone into the story about it and really spiraled. I mean, he probably would have had his breathing into a paper bag. And, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know what people should do if they're in panic attack situations. But I'm saying this is, you know, really, I think just be beautifully illustrative of how we, if we really fully feel like you were saying, things move through us quite quickly, usually much quicker than we think and definitely quicker than they do if we, you know, wrap a drama around it and start telling ourselves stories about how we or other people or the world sucks. <laughs> you know, it makes me think this is like nothing to the degree of the story, which is crazy incredible. Like that's insane to have someone just go like so scared and then all of a sudden get over it. And it makes me think of even just a couple days ago, I was talking to Jenny, who you recommended, amazing nutritionist, and she had me go on a sugar cleanse. And she had sent me the sugar cleanse in advance, and she told me that we might do it. I, I was scheduled to talk with her on Skype later that day, and I was just like so resistant to this freaking sugar cleanse. I went, I went to the grocery store, and I bought chocolate. Like, I didn't even want it, but I wanted to eat it just because I felt like it was going to be my last hurrah. <laughs> and I was just, ugh. so we start talking on Skype, and she brings out the sugar cleanse, and I'm just feeling like such a strong no, and she's asking me why, and I'm like, well, you know, I feel like I know with my blood sugar issues, sometimes I get really shaky, and this is going to impact my work and I'm not going to reach my goals, and I'm not going to this. And I just kind of like pounded her with all my reservations for like a minute and a half. And she was just lovingly answering, lovingly answer. And then all of a sudden, she's like, cool, I'll start tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that, that you went through all of that, and then you said, okay, I'll start tomorrow. Yeah, it's been, I'm four days in. I'm just like, cool. <laughs> Yeah. Let it out. <laughs> totally. <laughs> it makes me think about decision making, how sometimes we so try to make a decision, but maybe what we need to do is just feel a little bit, give it a little bit more space. 
it's pretty amazing what happens when we give ourselves a little bit more space. Yeah, that's something else that you're phenomenal at that I've been uh, working on, <laughs> but just not having to have that tight hold on whatever the decision is, I think is great. And how do you deal with like not feeling crazy anxiety when you give yourself space around something? <sighs> So usually I had crazy anxiety before I gave myself space, <laughs> you know, more of that or a break from that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that decision making is an interesting thing. You know, there's wisdom, like one school of thought is just like, you just make a decision. Like if you've been struggling with making a decision, you just make a decision and then you deal with the consequences. And I think that that's totally valid. And that's one way of making decisions. Another school of thought is like, take a break, give yourself some space from making the decision and then come back to it later and everything will come in its divine time. And I think there's also wisdom in that. But I think that it's not always one or the other. Some people tend more to give themselves lots of space to make decisions, but they just kind of perpetually never make decisions. And then there are other people who force decisions all the time and end up being in sort of disaster cleanup mode for a lot of their lives. And so I think that it's knowing you know, are we prone to making rushed decisions and kind of feeling not so stable with them after? In that case, maybe we could practice, like, what might it be like to give myself more space? And if we're the other way, maybe it would be helpful to, you know, give ourselves a deadline. But I think part of it is noticing where my, if I've been scrambling about making a decision, it's kind of like, I like to use the analogy of like, if you've lost your keys and you're tearing your entire house apart looking for the keys, like at some point, you're either going to decide, okay, I'm going to keep going crazy looking for the keys everywhere, or I'm just going to stop, take a deep breath and take the bus or <laughs> call a cab or something, you know? And often what happens is that mental, emotional space from having to make a decision so quickly you walk back in the house and you go, oh, wait a minute. I wore my green jacket yesterday. Go in the pocket and there are the keys. It's just amazing. So sometimes I notice that if I feel really pushed up against an edge with making a decision and I'm feeling a lot of anxiety around it, I'm just like, okay, it's time to either make the decision because I have no other choice or something. Like it's, you know, everybody's ordering dinner. <laughs> 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 or it's time to just take a deep breath and realize that I'm already in anxiety. So may as well give myself a break from that and see what happens if I come back to it in two days or a week or a month. I see that a lot with people who are, especially with relationships, they've got kind of, they're like desperately trying to figure out what to do about it. I was like that in my marriage for sure, like really for a couple of years, like desperately trying to figure out whether to stay or go. And I just realized at one point, like I'm halfway in and halfway out relationship. Am I actually ready to end it? No. Okay. Well, if that's the case, then I may as well just step fully in and give myself whatever it was, three, six months to not look at this door, to not look at this option, to not make a decision. I'm just going to settle in and devote myself to it. And, you know, if that doesn't give me clarity, then we'll figure it out then. Mm, I love that. That's such a great explanation. And even just saying it, like my whole body just feels calmer. <laughs> That's great. To touch base real quick on something on what we were talking about before, because it's nagging at me. I'd love to hear your take on it mm -hmm. about the feeling pain or feeling anything, feeling any emotion we don't want to feel and then letting it just pass. So like when you were going through your divorce or anything else that was tough in your life, do you think that if you would have just let the feelings go, feel the feelings, that it would have ended up dissolving? Or do you think that it's like layers of feelings? Or how did that work for you? That's a really good question. I definitely, at that time anyways, with my divorce, was terrified that if I felt my feelings, they would swallow me whole. Like I wouldn't be able to do any work. I wouldn't be able to do anything, you know, for indefinitely. <laughs> and... So I didn't, I just didn't really go there. I didn't really let myself feel that much during that time. Or I would give myself like, okay, I can, I'm going to allow myself to like feel this for 10 minutes and then I, and then I would really shut that off. But mostly I just wasn't really letting myself feel anything because I was terrified that it would, I would never find my way out again. So a couple years later, I had been in a relationship after my marriage and we broke up and it was incredible pain again, but I handled it very differently. 
And that time, I actually called my girlfriends right away, a couple of my girlfriends. And one of them, I said, I need to be near you. And I actually ended up the next day renting the apartment next door to her apartment for a month Mm. just to be right beside her. And I would come over to her house and I'd say, is it a good time? And she'd say, it's a good time. And I would just sit on the floor and sob and sob and sob and keep looking up at her and going, are you sure this isn't too much? And she'd go, nothing is too much. And I'd keep go sob and sob. And then, you know, after like 15 minutes or something, usually sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, I'd be like, okay, 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 I need to eat now. And I'd get up and I'd feed myself and I'd go do some work and then I'd feel another wave coming and I'd need to go cry again. Now I know that's not necessarily practical for every single person. You maybe can't like leave your office, you know, five times a day. But what I realized anyways is that when I really make space, especially in the presence of a friend or friends, to really feel and to have them there with me, to not be lonely in it, to be really witnessed in it, it would move so much more quickly. And now here's the tricky thing. I don't think that we can feel it all in the presence of others so that we can get over it quickly. I think it can <laughs> take however long it takes. But what I noticed is it just felt more complete. It felt like when I was working, I was able to actually focus on my work, even though I was going through a heartbreak. And I felt that when I was upset, I was just letting myself be upset. And so I think that this idea that if I feel it, it's going to swallow me up and I won't be able to do anything... Sure. Yeah. If you're crying on the floor for an hour, you're not working for an hour. I got that. But when you are working, you're going to be way more productive because you actually don't have this thing that's taking up 50% or 80% of your bandwidth, the bandwidth of your operating system. Mm. Yeah. Just really, really incredible how much more space it can give us. Yeah, I know that you have a super strong support network of just tons of friends around you. And actually, can you take a minute just to talk about how you're able to create that? Because I think it would be amazing for anybody to have someone they could go knock on their door and like cry on their floor. (laughs) I think a lot of people I talk to think that they would have to get new friends for that to happen. They don't have it, right? Because if you don't have it, you must feel like Maybe it's not possible or you just haven't gone there with your current friends. And so one of the things that I say to women is you don't actually, or people, you don't actually necessarily need a whole new group of friends. It doesn't mean don't go out and make new friends. I mean, by all means, I'm all for making new friends for our whole lives. Why not? There are a lot of humans on the planet. But, you know, one of the things is that I think just to be willing to take our conversations deeper, you know, Any one of us, I think, could agree that a lot of conversations that people have are very surface level, right? They're talking about the weather or the things that are annoying to them, whatever it may be, the the day-to-day stuff of life, but not really going into the depths. And so one thing I encourage people to do, and this is really how I cultivated more depth in my friendships and new friendships with more depth, is talking about how we feel about things and talking about what we want rather than what annoys us, commiserating around what annoys us or talking about the surface stuff. So it's like, oh, well, my husband, it's so annoying. He he never wants to help with anything. And then we're kind of just complaining about, you know, and commiserating on that versus like, well, how are you feeling about that? What are you, how are you taking that in? And what do you really want? And having these conversations where we're really about championing one another's desires And rather than just sort of catching up on what's been happening, we're talking about also like, where are we going? And I find that my relationships that are so fulfilling in my life, like what's at the the center of the relationship is that we are holding this vision for one another, that I can see my friends not only in the where they are in their day to day and how they're feeling in their hearts right now and the circumstances of their life today, But also, I'm really envisioning and holding and cheering for them in where they want to go in their lives. I find that those relationships are so rich when we're focusing on where we're going. And so for anybody who doesn't have friendships like that in their lives, what it might take is the courage to go to some of your current friends and say, you know, I I really want to have an even deeper friendship with you. You know, I just love you so much. And you've been such a great friend to me. And I, 
I want us to be even better friends, even deeper friends. Do you want that too? And like, let's talk about our desires for the future, our visions for the future. That's one thing. The other thing is, I think like stepping out of what we think is normal behavior in friendships a little bit. One of the ways that I see this show up is that we typically, when we think of like, what are the most important relationships in your life? A lot of people will say their partner and their family. And friends kind of often, not for everyone, but often will kind of take a lower rung on the totem pole. Now, I don't think that we need the totem pole necessarily. I think everyone that's close in our hearts is important in our lives. But certainly our friends are what support depth and richness and growth in all of our other relationships, you know, with our colleagues, with our partner, with our, our family. I think that it makes sense. It's important to nurture those friendships. So I think another thing is like, is it okay for like grown women to have sleepover parties? Yeah. Why not? <laughs> why not? We think that we're too grown up to do things like that. And we're not. So I think just also going like, oh, well, you know, maybe I just want to go out with my girlfriends and leave the kids at home for the day. And we're going to go ice skating. And the kids will come another time. Or, you know, let's have a dinner party and not just make it couples. Let me do this with my friends. And so creating time to nurture those friendships without a bunch of other people involved is also really healthy and really helpful. And then also I think, you know, for creating new friendships, I love meeting people at places where I love to be. So I love to go, for example, to dinner parties. So I let my friends know that I love to go to dinner parties and, and I organize dinner parties and I ask people to bring new friends that I've never met. You know, if somebody was like really into, I don't know what it, what it would be, yoga, like go to a yoga class and introduce yourself to somebody the way that kids do on a playground. <laughs> and I know that we can get kind of approach anxiety sometimes around meeting new people, but that's how we make new friends. So what do you say to somebody? I know you say hi, and then they say hi back. And how do you get to have this deep relationship with somebody? I mean, does it take like a few times after talking to them that you feel like you're in a deep rapport with them? Or can you do it on the spot? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I'll just trick up conversation with somebody. And sometimes it starts with one point of interest. It could be I first noticed, I don't know, that the color of their eyes, like that their eyes were really super beautiful, or that I love your sneakers or something. And so I might just come up and be like, oh, hi, you know, and then I'll introduce myself and then just, you know, start strike up a little bit of a conversation with them around, like if it's a yoga class, for example, have you come to this class before? Are there other teachers that you like here? Cool. Well, I'm coming to the Thursday class. Like, hopefully I'll see you at the Thursday class. Are you coming to that class too? And sometimes it, you know, especially if you're feeling a little nervous, it might take a couple times and then invite somebody out you know, to like go for tea with you and or ask them a question about their life. Like, so what do you what do you do when you're not at yoga? Do you have a job or are you, you know, a volunteer? What are you up to? What's exciting in your life right now? And just creating a friendship out of it. When I moved actually to San Francisco from New York, I would introduce myself and I would say, oh, I just moved to San Francisco. So I'm trying to get to know people in the neighborhood and and, you know, the people who are really warm and reciprocated interest, then awesome. It's a potential new friend. Mm. So have you had experiences where people weren't necessarily warm? And if so, how did you just like, okay? like Totally. <laughs> I'm like, oh, maybe they think I'm trying to pick them up or something. <laughs> yeah, I've had people who were pretty short with the conversation and I just seemed kind of disinterested and you know, I would just let it go and not make it mean anything about me or them. Just be like, okay, well, have a great day. Great talking with you. Bye. And just let it go. I actually have a friend who her daughter said to her, mommy, if you want to make friends with people, you just go up and you introduce yourself and you ask them how old they are. <laughs> the right strategy for adults. <laughs> and she said, and then you say, do you want to play? And if they say, no, you just say, okay, bye. And you go introduce yourself to somebody else. <laughs> and there's a, some real wisdom in that, which is just the willingness, first of all, to just go up and say hi to somebody 
and to trust that if this is somebody who you'll become a friend with, they're probably going to be receptive to your hello. Like they're not going to bite your head off. Um, and if they do bite your head off, they're probably not somebody you're going to be friends with. So it's okay. And that's the other point, which is just to be resilient about it, that if somebody is short with you, it doesn't mean that they're a mean person. Maybe they're just having a really rough day, you know, or maybe they're going through something in their life, or maybe, you know, they're a little skittish around meeting new people. And it doesn't mean anything about you. It doesn't mean that you said the wrong thing or put your foot in your mouth or you shouldn't do this anymore. So I think it, it kind of comes back to the very first thing we were talking about, which is just not making a not making it mean something and just, you know, continuing on and, and trusting, again, another theme. <laughs> <laughs> but just trusting that, you know, somebody who you will become friends with will reciprocate their interest in you as well. Mm. And when you were trying to get deeper with your friendships, did you have any, like, I'm sure that it was, was vulnerable to kind of ask, or did you ask people to go deeper? Did it just happen organically? With older friendships? Mm-hmm. For me, it's kind of happened organically. A lot of my older friendships, we already had a real sense of depth in the friendship. Um, but one of the things that I would consciously do is just notice where I would default to talking about the weather, you know, or giving just updates on life rather than really connecting in around my deeper heart and what was really going on with me. And I think that was the piece, just sharing what was really going on. You know, what are the things that I'm really feeling alone in the shower or when I'm laying in bed at night? You know, those things that we often don't tell anybody or we only tell our partner. Giving the space for me to share those things with my friends, to be that open and vulnerable with them. Mm, it's a great point. And what I really like about just making sure that you have lots of friends around is that it doesn't mean like make your partner have to be everything to you. Like it takes off the pressure off of them. Yeah. Because I mean, when you think about it for all of human history until recently, we lived in community. We would live in, in tribes and in many parts of the world, people still live in community. And so, you know, maybe we're not all going to go and move into a commune with 20 of our dearest friends, but it just indicates that this, you know, having one person be your absolute everything is so modern. If that's not flowing really easily, that's normal. <laughs> not really, we're not designed that way. And so I think really having it so that we can bring this stuff to other people in our lives. And yes, of course, we're going to bring some of it to our partner, right? That's part of what partnership is about, but also being willing to share what's going on in our lives with our friends for real and get that we all have stuff that we feel shame around. You know, everybody's had their moment with money stuff or relationship stuff or food issues or whatever it may be or questions about their career or feeling inadequate. We've all had that. So just getting that that one step it takes to be a little bit more revealing with our friends, a little more open. It also opens the door for them to do the same and for us to have a more close friendship. Yeah, absolutely. And what I love about what you were saying is that you see your friends also like as the visions of who they're becoming. And I think that when you can have those deep conversations and talk about what each other wants and their greatest desires and all this stuff, then when you see somebody in their full potential, it's just easier to not get upset by small things or whatever, because you understand kind of what's going on for the person. And I think that's probably where a lot of problems with kind of surfacey friendships are, you know? Mm -hmm, exactly. That's awesome. How have your, I guess, I'll I know that you've done a ton of evolution in your life as far as you went from being, was it um, emotional eater first or work out? Yeah, emotional eating first, right? Yeah, emotional eating first and for most of my life, you know, from childhood is what I mean, but really from childhood. And then when I was kind of in my teens, early 20s, shopping, people sometimes think that I mean credit cards. I didn't get in a bunch of credit card debt. What I mean is that I would like get my paycheck and spend all of it until all that was left was like enough money for ramen noodles. I was just filling my house with crap. I mean, just stuff. I just got this like emotional hit every time I bought something. It was like a numbing. It was a distraction from what was going on in my life. Food was definitely a numbing agent for me, a distraction. And then it was work. 
And that really came on strong when I started a business because I was able to kind of write off the compulsion as necessary for business, right? I'm starting a business. This is what startup mode looks like. (laughs) Yes, while building a business, especially in the beginning, may require a lot of elbow grease, love and attention. It doesn't require us to go numb to the other things in our life. It doesn't require us to use work to avoid those things. And that's what actually defined me as a workaholic, what distinguished my behavior as workaholism was that, you know, I was struggling in my marriage and to avoid that, I threw myself into work. So yeah, lots of compulsions in in my life. (laughs) And now where you are, you're, I mean, I, I consider you a pretty free person. I'm curious, what are some of the mindset shifts that you had to get from workaholism and the emotional eating and the shopping to where you are now? And I know you've covered some of them. Are are there any other ones that kind of popped to your mind? So the first thing was around the emotional eating. I just realized that part of it was because I wasn't feeling fulfilled in my life. I mean, this is such a big frame actually for all of them. It was just a lack of fulfillment. And so actually asking the question, having the courage to ask what is going to create fulfillment in my life and how can I do that now? It's not a someday game. It's a today game. It's not, oh, well, I'll be fulfilled once I finish all my work, once I'm a size six, once this happens, then I'll be able to be fulfilled. How can I actually create more fulfillment in my day to day? I mean, we've all seen images, met people who have far less than probably anybody listening to this podcast and yet have a joy. And I say that not to make us feel guilty if we don't feel joy, but to remind us that we have access to levels of fulfillment that don't require outward attainment of relationship, of money, of you name it. So for me, it was getting into doing yoga and meditation actually that helped me out of my emotional eating. It's just like I need to feel like my life is anchored by a practice. That's what I needed in that moment. But really I see meta of that, what it was about was creating fulfillment. I started painting. I started, I had an old camera, like an old film camera. And I started taking the camera around my neighborhood just taking pictures, taking the day off on Saturday and just walking around taking pictures. Those things actually helped me get out of my emotional eating. And the same with my workaholism was, I'm going to create time with my friends, even though I think that I have no time. I'm going to go to this Pilates class, even though I think I have no time. I'm going to buy flowers for myself, even though I don't think I've worked hard enough to deserve it. And so giving myself those gifts And I would say that one of the biggest things actually has been patience with myself and really looking at this as, you know, I'm 35 now. So, so really reminding myself, like I am, I'm, I'm like third to, you know, like, let's say I'm a third of the way through my life. I plan on getting really old. (laughs) I'm a third of the way through my life. I'm not supposed to have figured everything out yet. I've got a long way to go. And so, you know, if I haven't perfected how to do this or how to navigate this situation or whatever, or if I'm still struggling in this area, it's okay. I don't have to be so hard on myself and so mean to myself for not having it figured out. And what I found is just that bit of kindness and patience offered to myself. I used to think that if I was kind and patient with myself that nothing would get done, but actually... I'm not apt to like lay around and eat bonbons for the rest of my life. Might I want to lay around and watch television and eat bonbons for a few days? Yeah, but then I'd get bored. (laughs) And eventually I'd want to do something. And I'd want to do something that felt important to me and meaningful. And I would want to help people. And I would want to call my parents and, you know, and like spend time with the people I love. Trusting that I'm a good person. I have a good heart. And I can give myself some space to not be perfect now and What I found is that that patience and that space, it actually makes things move faster. Mm. I guess I was for a long time just stuck in this mindset that I needed to be a slave driver to myself. And all that created was anxiety on top of my guilt and on top of my feeling and then, you know, feeling like a failure. And feeling anxious, guilty, and like a failure 
for me is not super motivating. <laughs> like that actually drives me to want to lay on the couch and eat bonbons because why bother if I'm, you know, an anxious failure at life. But when I'm easier on myself, I find it's easier to focus. I find that I make better decisions because I slow down a little bit more. I find that I feel a little bit more resilient and can actually learn meaningful lessons from life experiences and not just learn, well, that proves that I suck and I shouldn't try, you know, <laughs> but empowering lessons that actually will help me in the future. I think patience is such a big one. I think a way that we can cultivate that patience is just to notice how we talk about, talk to ourselves and how we talk about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what I love to ask people is, how would you talk to your child? You know, if you were the most loving, grounded, well-resourced version of yourself, how would you talk to a little one? How would you talk to a little girl? If you were the most grounded, well-resourced, loving version of yourself. And that puts things in perspective pretty quickly. How are we talking to ourselves versus how we would talk if we were in that state and wanted to encourage a little one? Because in fact, I'm 35 years old. I haven't, I'm basically a little one. I haven't been on the planet that long. <laughs> and we just expect ourselves to be grown up by the time we're 12 and have it all figured out. Mm. You gave so many amazing pieces of advice there. The, the ones that are popping up at me are just number one. You're saying, you know, I've only lived one third of my life, so have some patience. I think that's such a great point. And then also just the going through and looking at yourself like a child. I mean, it, and because for sure, like we're supposed to love ourselves more than anybody. Like we have to be our greatest champions. So I think both of them are so great at perspective. You also touched on when you were doing the emotional eating, how you kind of asked yourself what practices would be good for you and meta. It was about how to be more fulfilled. And I'm curious, how did you know what would fulfill you? I just sort of noticed what felt like what was nudging at. You know, I think that we can overthink this one a little bit, but you know, sometimes I'll talk to people and they'll be like, well, I have thought about getting into painting and I'm like, cool, just don't ask any questions. Start there, <laughs> you know, and see, just see how it goes. It doesn't have to be like the hobby that's going to be our thing for the rest of our lives or like, it doesn't have to be perfect. I think just also taking the frame that fulfillment was like, well, you know, I don't need to start a movement necessarily. I don't need to decide that I'm going to now go in and invest $900 in a new camera. I don't, you know, have to start a club. I can just invite my girlfriends out for dinner. I can just take my iPhone out and take pictures. You know, I can just, you know, take one dance class and see how I like it. Mm -hmm. And so in a way it was, as my friend Paula Arasco calls it, following the breadcrumbs. It's just following the breadcrumbs of what it was that I wanted to do next, and the next, and the next, and the next. Oh, I love that. I call it follow the pleasure, but both same mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> I feel like I could talk to you forever, but I know we're about to hit the hour. <laughs> so <laughs> I would love to just kind of wrap up by asking, what would you say to somebody right now who might be inspired by you, but they're still feeling scared to make changes in their own life? What advice would you give them? My advice would be to just envision the future that you really want for yourself, for your life, maybe for the world. And notice, and you know, if you've done that before, you might also envision like if nothing changes in your life and you keep doing what you're doing or you, you know, allow the fear to stop you from moving forward, what's the future that you're looking at? So what's the future that you're on track for if you do absolutely nothing? Which I know we're making it all up, we don't really know. But, and then what's the future that you really want? And what I like to say to people is think of what three steps could be to move you in that direction that each step takes three minutes or less. Mm -hmm. So three steps, each one taking three minutes or less. So for example, if you're a person who's like, I hate my job, but I don't know what I want to do. Do I want to go to grad school or do I want to get a new job? You know, it could be just sending an email to your friend who's an architect and saying, you know, I just want to let you know I've been thinking about architecture as a career. Can I take you out for lunch, for example, right? But just three steps that take three minutes or less just to start the ball rolling, just to get movement, a little bit of movement. 
Because once you take those first steps, it creates a little bit of momentum that will start moving you naturally, even if you kept that job, for example. But it still creates a momentum that generates greater alignment in the direction of what you want. Mm, I love that idea because I think like you were saying, a lot of, I know you said for you, you don't get motivated by being anxious about things. And I imagine most people are like that. So I think just taking less than nine minutes to do three actions would really just shake up so much energy for somebody. That's awesome. Yeah. And it can be, it's just so quick. Sometimes I think we look at the change and we're like, oh my gosh, it's so daunting. I don't know where to start. We do know where to start if we just allow ourselves to make the starting point very, very small. Mm, I love it. So I know that if people had notebooks with them, they're going to have taken a million notes. (laughs) They're going to replay this because this was phenomenal. So thank you so much. And I would love if you could let people know where they can go to learn more about you. Yeah, my website is just my name. It's nishamoodley.com, N-I-S-H-A-M-O-O-D-L-E-Y.com. I'm also on Twitter at Ask Nisha. People can just search my name on Facebook. I definitely hang out on Facebook the most of any of those. Awesome. Well, again, this has been so good. I'm so excited.